Hi, this week on LOCAD TV, we're joined by Nicholas Vanderpoot, a supply chain scientist who specializes in demand forecasting, as well as having a strong technical background managing a multinational supply chain. Nicholas also has a keen interest in education. As such, he spent time lecturing at the University of Brussels, and he's also just released his book entitled Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasts. So Nicholas, thanks very much for coming in today. Um, as always, it's really nice to sort of get to know a little bit about our guests. So perhaps you could kick things off by just sort of explaining a bit about yourself, telling us how you got involved in the world of sort of supply chains. Yes, yeah, so as you said, I'm someone very interested into lectures, but also into learning. So I like to spend my time reading books, reading articles, going online to check blogs. And I had the opportunity to learn a lot. And now I'm also extremely happy to be able to apply that. At some point in time, I had the impression that I had the, the willingness to share that into a book. So I took the time to write a book to summarize uh, this new field of data science, because I think this is something really new. And then something that is also new is how to apply that to supply chain, which is really specific. People speak of data science for, for example, uh, online marketing, but supply chain is a different topic. So I took the time to bring that uh, together. OK, so the book's called Data Science for Supply Chain Forecasts. Bit of a mouthful, but uh, what's, what's it about? So it's exactly as, this, as the title says, it's about uh, supply chain and it's about how to apply data science to get the forecast for supply chain right. So it's, when you think about it, in the past people used what I like to call old school statistic, which comes with many different questions. But now that we move into a new world of data science, the qu some question remains, but some question are new as well. We need to find new way to deal with data. And this book is about this new age coming in to prepare people for that. Okay, and as always, we're joined by Johannes Vermeerel. Johannes, you've had a sort of a sneak peek at the book. Um, what's your perspective on it? So, yes, uh, I had a sneak peek. I had uh, the manuscript. I had the chance to review the manuscript. And it's, um, it's very, very good, first. Uh, so for the, I would say, supply chain managers out there, uh, if you've not, you, you do not have in your team someone who has already his hands on data science tool, you should get a copy and make sure that you read it, at least the first few chapters, and then have at least some other people in your team to read the other chapters and maybe you know act on it. But um, what is very interesting is that um, the fantastic progress of those um, s open source statistical toolkits. Um, I would say that up to 10 years ago, they were open source toolkits to do, I would say, advanced statistics. But it was mostly researchers demonstrating things to other researchers. So yes, the, co the code was there. You could already do a lot of things, but it was messy. It was, uh, I would say, research grade, not production grade. Uh, and um, the whole thing was very difficult, I would say, to comprehend. For, for many reasons, the code is a mess, the documentation is inexistent and whatnot. And what really changed over the last, I would say, ten, five to 10 years, let's say probably, is that those, um, uh, um, with the emergence of data science, a lot of actually university professors started to really pay attention to um, the quality of the statistical package so that they would become accessible to their students. So to make sure that the documentation was impeccable, that the terminology was consistent across many packages so that the same thing would be called the same so that um, um, also looking back to filter things that were really considered as mainstream from so t that work in large variety of situations let's say for example random forest from things that are very exotic let's say tick off regression that you might only encounter once in a while um, and so the bottom line is that I would say the, the open source community at large, with the help of academics, uh, did produce um, a series of package, open source package that were driven by one programming language, Python, which turned to be, I would say, uh, uh, very, very accessible. And I think what is interesting is that in this book, uh, Nicholas is basically taking the good parts of Python, the good parts of those, uh, of the most relevant packages to basically demonstrate how you can have, I would say, close to state of the art forecast with minimal amount of effort, which is very impressive. 
Okay, so Nicholas, what kind of changed in the open source community? What kind of happened in order to improve kind of the quality of what was out there? Exactly like Jonas said, um, I think it's a question of how easy to how easy is it to populate a forecast? Ten years ago, five years ago, it would have been a mess, and this book wouldn't have been possible. It would have been called maybe the same plus for extremely motivated professional. Whereas today, the message is really you can do it. Any professional with a bit of of curiosity, passion could do it. It's rather easy. You just need your own laptop for with, like you said, uh, free uh, software, so it doesn't cost a euro, and you can start yourself with a really easy language. Uh, some years ago, that would have been possible. It would have been more complex. So right now, you have the ability to easily test something on your own for free, easily on your own computer. And from there, you have the ability to experiment. And at, as it is easy to experiment, you can do more experiments, and then you can really uh, fine-tune, tailor the forecast, the, 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 the code, the data science, just for your specific case. In the past, that wouldn't have been possible. Okay, and Johannes, um, it's not just the forecasting world that's benefiting from open source sort of software. Um, do we have an example of other industries that really benefited from having open source uh, sort of toolkits available? I mean, the open source movement is super, super vast. So literally, all the software world nowadays is, you know, contaminated by open source, you know, uh, um, all the major cloud computing providers are basically running their own clouds based on uh, on Linux. I mean, 90% of it is, is, is open source. Um, even even LOCAD, you know, what we are building uh, is even if LOCAD is not open source per se, 90% of the software that we actually use is open source. Uh, even Microsoft, you know, we, we happen to use Azure. So we are using a lot of Linux on Azure. .NET is itself open source. I mean, it's it's like open source plus open source. Even uh, the deep learning toolkits that we're using is also it's uh, the CNTK um, toolkit of Microsoft, which is also open source. So, and we also release LOCAD ourselves quite a few bits as open source as well. So I think it has been a movement that has been ongoing for uh, uh, strongly for for multiple decades. And uh, what is interesting is that I think in terms of uh, to get back, you know, to forecasting and supply chain is was not necessarily the fact that it was open source. It had been open source for a long time. I think the, 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 the game changing thing was that you had you had pieces of open source that are incredibly packaged, well packaged and well documented. That's 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 completely, I would say, game changing. It means that it means the difference between you can get started to do something simple, such as a linear regression, as explained in the book, uh, in literally 20 lines of code, which are very straightforward, versus um, 200 lines of code and probably a month of getting all your pieces of software together so that you have something that would even compile because all the things that the, um, the environment would not be compatible you have a piece of code that is not compatible with another piece of code and when you glue them together they crash and whatnot and whatnot and whatnot and you end up needing a month of just plumbing just to get something published by somebody else to to work so that if you want to replicate um, just to, to something that is a bit mind-blowing nowadays is that uh, for example to install your world your, your wall um, Python environment, um, there is a section in the book about, you know, setting up all your environments to, to do this data science. And it's, it's a very, very small section of the book. It's just, it's just something like two pages. You just type this command line, install Anaconda, and bim, you're done. Yeah, this is it. You have a whole Python environment. Uh, and it will work on pretty much any flavor of Linux. And nowadays, even with the Linux subsystem on Windows, it will also work on pretty much any, any Windows system within, within a few lines. And I think the book is doing an excellent demonstration of the ease of access to those tools, which, is, which has really changed, even more than just open source. It's open source plus production grade packages. Mm. If I may add something to this, I like in the book to discuss, and, and I think to the professional looking at us, they, they will recognize this kind of person using VBA, using this macro in Excel. And when look look at these people with all the code in, in VBA to run a, a simple macro in Excel, it always looked to me like really impressive. It looks really complicated. And these people were always fixing things because bugs everywhere. And in the end, it just moved around a couple of columns or so. I've always been really impressed by how complex this can be. And when I 
when, when you ask to someone, okay, did you ever thought about going to Python or it could be R or another language? They're like, whoa, this sounds super complex. I, I, I am no engineer, I'm not an IT genius, I'm no geek, I will not do that. Mm -hmm. But the message I really want to bring in with the book is that it's, it is actually much easier. It is much easier to do something in Python or R or another open framework that, that works rather than to do it in VBA or, or in a macro in Excel as people used to do in the past, but still do today. So the, the tools have changed and it's much more easy, easier to use them. That's really the message. Okay. So Janice, it sounds um, from your perspective, does this not make you a little bit nervous? <laughs> the fact that there's all these forecasting tools out there that are all open source, they're apparently very easy to use. So does that worry you? So, I mean, for um, uh, an enterprise software vendor like Locat, who is providing you know various software tools, including forecasting, yes, I mean it's it, it, it's part of the ecosystem. It's it's also a, those things are also an enabler. We are using those open source tools as well internally, so we don't necessarily rebuild everything. Also, but indeed, it's a, it's a challenge of where is your added value? I mean, as a, as a vendor, and I think if if your added value is that you are capable of just implementing semi-complicated um, forecasting model, and this is it. I think it means that you literally don't have any added value compared to the ecosystem. So, and, and the book just, you know, um, I would say is closing the coffin of vendors that were um, basically selling a forecasting toolkit uh, with half a dozen of forecasting models. I mean, I don't see, I'm not sure exactly where Autobox stands nowadays, but I, I don't see, you know, any value in having um, uh, a vendor trying to sell um, a few dozen of, of, of forecasting models that you will find in, um, in SciPy or any of those popular Python toolkits. On the other hand, where, where I see that there is still potential and where I would say the book is not the end-to-end the -end answer to but it doesn't pretend to do of, of supply chain changes. Uh, I, I see that um, you still have challenges when you encounter, uh, when you want to have a really production grade setup. And when you want to, to, to do things at scale. When I, I mean at scale, I mean potentially hundreds of thousands of SKUs and, um, and, and when basically the amount of data become, become large. But even, but even I would say, the, the, the setting up, I would say, uh, a supply chain that is optimized uh, with machine learning in a way that is completely production grade entails a lot more, uh, many, many challenges beyond just, just the forecast. And one of the angle of LOCAD is to try to bring an answers to, um, to those challenges as well. But I, I might not digress too much, I would say, from, um, to, to stay on topic on, on the book. But to, 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 to add something there, and I think it's really interesting, when you read such a book and when you start, because I, I think for many professionals, for, for many students, for many people in the supply chain world, machine learning is still, from, for some people it might, they never heard about it, for some people it's like a magic word, some of them might think it's just something marketing related, in five years from now no one will discuss about this anymore, and it, in reality it is. And now if you read this book and you, if, you, if you just think, okay, this is something new, I'm just going to take some time to read about it to understand what it is, then you're much better prepared than to, to get a solution like look at that can go really one step further, as you said, that can get the whole solution end-to-end -end working. And of course, to run a forecast in a supply chain environment, you also need a full process of review with people and so on. So the, the populating the numbers of the forecast is just one step in the whole process. And mm -hmm. the, the objective of the book is just to discuss this specific step. But it's not because you just read the book that you have to do it by yourself. You can also go to other vendors like Locat to understand, okay, Locat, I've read this in the book. How does it work for you? How can we implement that? I have this ID. Would it work? Can we test it? And then you start to understand what other uh, software vendors like Locat are really doing. Okay. So a lot of these ideas have kind of been developed from a theoretical perspective. Um, could they be applied in a production sort of, sort of way? Yes. So totally. So these, these new forecasts have been, I, I mean, neural networks, the theory became like it was first released, in, I think, in the 60s or something. And the first model in the books also comes from the 60s. So it, it has been there for a long time. And we only start to use them today in, in a production environment just because it has become today easy to run, whereas maybe 10 years ago it wasn't. And people w are now more aware of it. But for sure, you can use that. And what is really interesting with data science, and that's one of the big purposes of the book, is that 
it's really science. You can test it. You can do experiment and you can test it over and over and over again over data. That's why it's called data and science because you can really test it to prove yourself. Does it work? Yes, no, it might not work, but then you can think, okay, I'm going to design a new experiment, take new things into account, or remove stuff that I do not need to see if it's going to work better. So it's really a sign. So you can really prove your point that your forecast is going to be better and only start to use it as of then. Okay, so it can be kind of used as a kind of a proof of concept before you'd approach someone like Locat. Um, so Johannes, when, it's, when we're talking about moving on to sort of a production basis and using it on a daily basis, what are those challenges that people might come up against and what is it that Locat can really help in terms of that full process? So um, first, you need to get good data. So that's that's one part which is, uh, you know, you, if, if you do not have data that is very qualified in depth, you end up with garbage in, garbage out. The interesting thing with of this book is that by, um, if for, for the people in supply chain who would read it, is that that would give them a taste of what the models are doing, what kind of things they can leverage. And so that would give them, I would say, a better understanding of why do they need to start paying attention now to a whole series of, of I would say, gray area in supply chain, such as, for example, promotions. Typically, the data on promotion, it's complete mess. Um, uh, they on, on stockouts, also, it's as, as simple as it sounds. Frequently, there is no proper historical version, uh, historical data to reflect all the stockouts. So basically you don't know if you had zero sales because there was zero demand or if you had zero sales because you, you it was out of stock, exactly. Um, so, so, and there is a lot of, I would say, details in that. And so being more familiar with, I would say, the sort of model that can exploit the data can make you, I would say, more susceptible to see whether your, um, your existing process that, that gather data, again, the, ex the first supply chain exists, you know, to, um, uh, to, to keep the flow of goods moving. So, so the, the first, the primary goal of a supply chain is not to compile an accurate uh, historical database. So that's, that's only a secondary target. So, so that's why usually this secondary target is not necessarily executed with the same level of quality than the first target, which is just to serve everyone and keep the, the production units producing and keep the clients served, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I would say that would be our expand your horizon. Um, and, and here, uh, what look at when we, when we start, we also help a lot our clients to basically accelerate this transition of getting um, the their, all their data in order and to do that at scale with potentially multiple sites, multiple systems. I mean, there is a, a whole know-how know -how on how do you execute even just all the, the, this, I would say, data consolidation. But having, again, an eye on how this data is, exp uh, I would say, an understanding and insight on how this data is going to be exploited would help. And so the, the book would mm. help. And then Afterward, there is also another thing, which is um, how do you turn those forecasts into decisions, supply chain decisions? And again, uh, I think one of um, the challenge that we see in when we interact with our clients is that typically um, clients may not even imagine that some kind of numerical recipe are even possible. You know, that, that they don't even realize that necessarily it's even possible to do those advanced things with the forecast to generate the better decisions. And again, the interesting thing of, of reading the book and, and getting a taste of data science is that it can expand your horizon to get better insights on all the things that could be done, I would say, further down the, 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 the path with those forecasts to, to, to execute better the supply chain. And again, Locat can also help with that as well. But, but the interesting thing is, again, expand your horizon so that you can see the better picture of what comes before the forecast, so that data production, and after the forecast, which is exploiting those forecasts to turn them into, into decisions, smarter decisions. Do you have some thoughts on that? Yes. Um, to me, uh, as you said, we lack in supply chain, and I'm really, it's a message for supply chain leaders. If you think about it, you really miss two things to really get to the point of, of 
getting an action out of data science and machine learning, which is automation, better forecast, and so on. So you miss two things. The first thing, as you just discussed, is data. For sure, today in supply chain, we do not have, I'm really talking for 99% of companies in the world in supply chain, I think, we, are not, we do not have a culture of data. I think for most people, it is fine to, 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 to firefight against missing data. People are in Excel with, yeah, you know, what spreadsheets look like, and it's a mess. So people miss data. And this book also wants people and shows them that as soon as you get proper data, you can get proper science, proper forecast, as, as we just discussed, proper experiment and so on. If you don't have this data today, you cannot start the project. I've seen a huge amount, a uh, huge number of projects that got delayed because of no data and because it took so long to get data. I'm sure Jonas also have a huge list of <laughs> projects that delayed you today. Yes. So that's, that's one thing for sure we all agree that data is missing. And then something else is the fact that we, we miss in supply chain talents and people that understand machine learning, understand data science. Today, if you go to a new supply chain and you say, OK, we have some ideas for machine learning, most of people are looking like, wh wh what is it? I've, I've seen people thinking that machine learning was about finding a USB key, some sort of magical USB key that you would put in your computer and we, it would sort out all your email, tell you what to do or even do it for you. You could go get a coffee and that was your day. So people, some people get overly high expectation of it. Some people are really low expectation of it. So this is the two things we miss, data and, and awareness and, and, and uh, yes, know-how. And James, how do we change that culture? How do we evangelize the market so that there's a much more importance placed on having the correct data. Uh, I think we, we can start a cult <laughs> <laughs> where forget understanding, let's just go full mysticism, you know, like like there is a cult, better data is mandatory. It's, uh, <laughs> it's like one of your commandments, like first commandment, clean your data. Uh, but, uh, but more seriously, um, I, I, I think that it's when you have la lack of awareness of what can be done with the data, when you to have no culture on exactly etc it's very hard to be honest to even see the point yeah so so indeed um th i think in starting with this book of get get your hands dirty in actually doing some kind of data crunching and um, not being i would say completely buried under the pure technicality of the task so that it doesn't take an IT team just to set up the environment. It's very important so that you can grasp what will make those methods ticks, what will make them work. Uh, because indeed it, it's really not magic and also I think it's very very good if we can demystify. So, um, so I mean look at we have tried for, for a couple of years to also um, evangelize our market. I think educating is a path forward. Um, Nicolas is publishing a book, which is very good. We also did publish a book, uh, but we also did publish um, uh, quite a few things, you know, with an extensive knowledge base on the on on the local website. But but yes, the bottom line is is education, and at some point, what I see is um, a new wave of I would say supply chain practitioners coming to supply chain, which are more, I would say, um, that, that comes with more um, an engineering mindset. Quantitative. Y yes, quantitative. I mean, the idea is that, that um, you, you, you want to have numbers, you want to have things that, that can be repeated. Um, leadership is very important, yes, because supply chain is, is made of a lot of people, a lot of countries, a lot of stuff, etc. absolutely. But if you have leadership without any kind of engineering mindset, quantitative mindset, and uh, it, it's very hard to optimize anything because as soon as you start to, as soon as you, you, you use the word optimize, the, the, there is the one cardinal rule of optimization is that you cannot optimize something that you do not measure. So you end up of how do you measure, and then you end up with you need data, better data, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Nicholas, we've spoken a lot about the benefits of using these open source toolkits. How about some of the drawbacks? Where do you see some of the negatives with using these toolkits? So as, as we discussed, and I think that's really important in the world of supply chain. So supply chain, is, it's a lot of interaction between, as you said, so products, people, uh, different teams, and so on. So the process of, of forecasting is a very long process with many different stakeholders in this process. So the book is really just saying, you know what? Uh, for the last decades, yes, we have been using the same techniques. And it's true that if you look back in the 80s or 90s, if you took back a software version from the 80s, it's still the same forecast engine as it is today. So nothing changed. So I'm just saying we can change this 
It's a very specific piece. But of course, as we discussed, that's not enough. The whole process needs still to, to, to live and to evolve. So just using Python won't solve a, a, a process that does not work. It will just improve the, the really the, the numbers out of the forecast. But of course, you need to still take a look at the full process. Okay. And Johannes, you sort of seem very confident that there's always going to be a place for LOCAD. Um, looking forward, where do you see that place in the marketplace actually being? So, um, first, I believe that even if we are talking of pure forecast, um, I believe we still have a cards to play to have better forecast. Um, knowing that better becomes more t is more tricky than ever because you see, um, it's a thing that you say you have a more a better forecast in sense of mean absolute error. Yes, but as soon as you enter the probabilistic world, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's another game. And then if you start to say, yes, but I want to forecast the demand, but not tomorrow, but on a probabilistic horizon, that is when my container will arrive. So I have, so it's, it's a demand that starts at an uncertain point of time in the future that ends at an another uncertain point of time. I mean, things can get very complicated for, I would say, um, uh, with more dimensions then if you start to include factors like, well, there is also the probability that my competitor drop their price, so that will have a very specific impact on the shape of the demand. So you see, it's accuracy on forecast is, is not a one-dimensional thing. So, it, it has, so, so there is this whole complexity to address. And the reality is that as you start bringing in a lot of variables, suddenly your models become complex. Even if you have very nice uh, open source toolkits, plumbing all those things together in a way that is like bug free and production grade and where it's scale and everything, there is still a lot of, of things to do. Um, then, but that, that's I would say if we take, you know, the pure forecasting angle. I believe that's, that's one, um, one approach. I think for, for LOCAD, our, our vision is really to have like the more like the the end-to-end -end, um, analytical overlay to generate smart decisions for a given supply chain. So we don't manage a supply chain in the sense we are not the ERP. We don't want to be to 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 be the the repository of all the inventory movements, etc. We have a copy of this data, but we are the smart analytical overlay. So that's that's more the vision. And again. Um, even if LOCAD was entirely built out of open source tools, there is still value in, in bringing all of that together. You know, it's, for example, to a large extent, the cloud computing platforms that are available nowadays are gigantic mashup of, of open source mm -hmm. stuff. So, but still people like to, have Amaz to go for Amazons because yes, you could, you could do it yourself. You can, you can have your own private cloud, but it's such a massive amount of effort to just bring all those things together that at some point there is value in having specialists that just do it forever. Okay. For Plus maybe in the drawback, I would maybe answer one thing about the drawback that I see about um, uh, this ecosystem of Python and open source, very specifically, is that it's evolving so fast. So there is, there is one specific uh, thing, which is if you, if you do it yourself, there is one danger, is that you pick, um, you know, a flavor of, 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 of Python and a toolkit, and then two years down the road, there is something that is like a dramatically improved version of this package that has become available. And suddenly, you were state of the art, and suddenly you're not, just because, you know, the world just kept moving, and as a lab, just produced a new uh, a, a new toolkit. For example, now I mean I would say, Scikit was really state of the art on pretty much everything up to a couple of years ago. Now PyTorch is really completely yep. rechallenging the whole thing by bringing deep learning and even differentiable programming to the picture. So it brings a question: Is who is responsible to basically revisit what you've implemented two years ago? And refresh, refresh, and replace with the flavor of the day, mm. and and again, that's that's also something where um, I, I think a very good vendor would basically um, take care of you know 
making sure that whatever solution, data science solution is adopted, this solution is basically routinely revisited and probably routinely rewritten to st st state of the art. I don't know how long this golden age of, of, of progress of, of data science will, will, uh, will last. But I would not be surprised if probably for something like the, 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 the decade to come, every two years we see some fantastical yep. you know, progress where the, the new flavor is so much better than the previous one, where there is like categories of problems that seem super hard to, to address that becomes accessible. Okay. If I may add something yeah. uh, there, and I think it's really, really interesting that Jonas mentioned the complexity that Lockhead is able to deal with. And I've, I've worked personally with Lockhead's team, so I know what they're capable of. Um, one of the message of the book, and I think this is really important to me, I've really written this book saying to people, uh, you can do it, right? And now some people might have heard what Jonas is saying, saying, whoa, <laughs> no, data science machine learning seems really, really complex. Maybe that's not for me. And I really want to reassure people by saying, uh, no, it's not that complex. You can start with a simple model. And actually, as the book is showing, you can fairly easily start with a very simple model that's actually extremely strong as it is. And then from that, add layers, maybe tweak a bit the system, tweak a bit the data, maybe bring another model in, and so on, and so on. So you can really, and I, I, that's really the message I, I want to, to put forward in the book, you can start simple with something that will work already really well, and from there, then go to uh, more complex and more complex model. So, and on top of that, the, the data science principle to understand uh, how do I know if a model is working, can I test it, can I replicate, and so on. These principles apply for simple models, but once you understand them for simple model, you also understand them for much more complex model. So it's the same. So you, I really would like to advise people, start simple, you can do it, and then from there, then you can really go to something much more complex. Okay, and that brings me quite neatly on to my sort of last question, is what are your hopes for the readers of your book and for the use of open source toolkits going forward and for the future? My, the, the vision I have and really the hope I have is that people will read that and will, will trust that they can do it and read the book and at the end of the book, they will put it on the table and say to themselves, yes, I, I really can, this doesn't look so complex. I, uh, maybe two weeks ago when I started it, I was no IT geek. I couldn't code on my computer, but in the end, it, it looks very simple. I can do it. And for these people to start to experiment by themselves, which is really leaving the data science and, and trying new models, and for these people to become the new leaders in supply chain, I think, and that's also one of the messages of Lockett, uh, we will be, uh, we are already in a supply chain quantitative world where you can really do experiments and you can do thing that will work over and over and keep consistent. And to do that, you need data science. So I really hope that the book will allow people to do that for themselves. OK, great. Well, we're going to have to wrap it up there, but thanks for your time today. OK, so um, the book, Data Science for Supply Chain Forecast, is out now. So make sure you check it out on Amazon. Uh, here at Locad TV, we'll be back again soon with another episode. But until then, thanks for watching.